Hey, y'all, who dat? And welcome in. I am Jeff Nowak. This is Inside Black and Gold. I'm coming at you solo today, the final day before mandatory minicamp. I apologize if my voice goes in and out. I've been under the weather all weekend. I'm still not fully here, but I'm going to get you a podcast here. It's just going to be me today because I did want to go over something that I've been kind of tracking throughout OTAs, really throughout the offseason. And it is something that until training camp, we won't really get a full answer to. We're not going to get answers to all of them this week. But I did want to break down, kind of project the roster battles, the position battles that we'll be watching, that we will be tracking throughout training camp. Now, it's not all specific positions. Some of these are roles. Some of these are our ideas, right? Some of these are kind of projecting what we expect to see in the offense and who's going to do it. But that's what we're going to go with. Now, this first segment, we're going to kind of talk about some of the things that build into minicamp, some of the things we'll be watching for, any any drama over contracts, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about in this first segment. Second segment is going to be defensive position battles, Final segment is going to be offensive position battles. So if you are looking for anything specifically related to the offense or defense, feel free to skip ahead. Otherwise, let's talk about minicamp. Now, if you've been following all the action that's been going on in training camp, you will kind of understand that this is pretty much the same thing, right? Like you're not doing anything crazy during mandatory minicamp that you weren't doing during OTAs. The biggest difference from a media perspective is that we are out there all three days. During OTAs, we only got to watch one day of practice. So we had to kind of guess what was going on the other days. You know, we it's easy to overreact to, hey, this guy had a rough day on Tuesday. We don't know whether he had a bounce back day on Wednesday or Thursday or, you know, whatever day that we were not out there. So it's been something, it's, it's always something that you have to kind of take with a grain of salt. Like, well, this guy looked fantastic. He could have fallen flat in his face on the other two days we weren't there. We just don't know. So that's kind of the benefit of, for us, from the coverage perspective, mandatory minicamp, because you can kind of make determinations over a three-day period that is really difficult to do in one day, particularly for guys like the offensive line that you really just don't get a ton of And you don't want to spend your whole time staring at the offensive line when you're only out there for one practice. Now, this time, I'll probably take Tuesday and really just hone in completely during team drills on the offensive line because just an opportunity to do that without missing out on some of the other things. So just something to keep in mind. Now, there are some elements of minicamp that change for the team as well. But the biggest change comes pretty obviously with the name. It's mandatory. Now, you would expect everyone to be there. When we asked Dennis Allen last week, he said he expects 100% attendance. Talked to Marcus Robertson. He said he expects guys like Marshawn Lattimore, Paul Sandibo to be there. But this is always the first kind of sign of concrete sign when things aren't going well, right? Like OTAs are not mandatory. So absences don't necessarily indicate a budding issue. They might indicate, hey, I've I've got family stuff. I've got whatever. That's Nathan Shepard hasn't been there for any of these OTA sessions. And Dennis Allen said it's a family issue. So who knows what that is specifically, but you at least understand that it's not, hey, I don't want to be here, so I'm not showing up, right? Other guys have injury issues, right? We haven't seen Chase Young. We haven't really seen Kool-Aid and Kinstry. They're working back from injuries. Jalen Ford, we didn't see for the first OTA sessions, the first two OTA sessions, but the third one, he got back on the field, right? So there are reasons where you're like, okay, I'm not going to overreact. I'm not going to jump over a fence here and start saying, oh, no, what are we going to do? Because they're probably going to show up. That changes this week. Because if you don't show up for these sessions, there are significant fines on the table. Why wouldn't you show up? It's almost never going to be because of scheduling. It's almost always going to be because, hey, I want a new contract. So for a guy like Paulson Adebo, who we have not seen each of the last two weeks, now keep in mind, this is kind of how he operated last year. He went to the first session and we didn't see him again. I believe he missed the second session. I can't recall whether he missed the third session, but it's not unusual for him not to be there. That said, he's the only player on the roster, in my opinion, who 
should feel like I have earned that next contract already. I shouldn't have to go into a contract year and prove to you that I am worthy of a, ne- of a second contract because I have played well above my draft slot. He was a third round pick, right? He, you, you look at it and you say, yeah, these guys make a ton of money. Well, a third round pick doesn't, you know, relative to a regular person, right? relative to a non-professional athlete, yeah, they make a ton of money. Relative to the amount of work he's put in and relative to the, his contemporaries at the cornerback position, he's making change. So not unlike CJ a few years ago where he was a fourth round pick. He came into that final season and said, hey, I've earned that contract. I shouldn't have to go out there and risk injury in my contract year when you know exactly what I can provide for you, when you know exactly what impact I have on the field. Pay me now. The Saints wouldn't do that. It got awkward. CJ got traded. Now, CJ and Paulson probably couldn't be any more dissimilar to each other in in the sense of how they handle things from a media perspective or from just a public speaking perspective. Like CJ would never shut up (laughs) about anything, whether it was a good thing, whether it was a bad thing, whether it was something he was excited about, whether it was something he was mad about, couldn't shut up. Paulson is the exact opposite. Like we don't know what Paulson is thinking a lot of the time. He's a lot more like Marshawn in that way where he kind of keeps to himself. And for that reason, like if there was budding issues with Paulson we probably wouldn't know about it so it's just something to keep in mind when you when you consider everything that's happening on the field during minicamp it's something to watch because you know I think there was this idea that hey there could be some issues with with CJ going into that year but I don't think anyone really realized just how bitter things were getting and it wasn't until he started you know holding out during during practices and like pick getting a pick six and then sprinting into the cooling chamber uh, and and never returning, right? It wasn't until we start seeing stuff like that that it was like, okay, this is going to be an issue, and he's not going to be willing to play out the final year of his deal without assurances, or at least not willing to do it in a way that is productive for you because he's going to make sure he's heard. He's going to make sure everyone's aware of it. So I'm not saying that's going to happen with Paulson, But this is where, if it was, we would start to see that. So it's just something to consider. Is there any tension around that contract? Is there any tension around his involvement on the field? We're going to find out. Same thing with Lattimore. I mean, Marshawn's not looking at a contract, but is there, does there seem to be tension surrounding, you know, his, his involvement? I, I'm not sure we're going to hear from him. I would be surprised if he talks to the media during minicamp, he's required by the CBA to speak to the media during training camp, right? So we will talk to him during training camp, whether he likes it or not. Like they, they typically will get everyone in front of the media at least once. And if they don't, then it becomes an issue. So I expect we'll hear from him then. I don't expect to hear from him now, but I just think, you know, he's going to be, all eyes are going to be on Marshawn, how he's engaging, how he looks. Does he look like he's in shape? I'm sure he will be. He never is a guy who shows up and you're like, he hasn't been doing the work in the off season. But I do think that there's a potential for some awkwardness. So, so we'll find out. Um, another guy who's going to be there for the first time this off season is Alvin Kamara. And while I don't anticipate the same level of, okay, are we worried that this isn't going well? I do think there's going to be a lot to watch with Alvin. Because we've seen this offense kind of flow and work with all the motion, with all the with all the pre-snap stuff um, with some of these other guys. But a lot of that is going to be with Alvin Kamara as a focal point. One of the reasons that I haven't taken a ton of time and really dove into, well, how does this offense look, is because he's going to be such a massive part of that offensive attack that I just don't know if you're, if you've been showing a lot of it in terms of what you've been installing uh, that when he's not there, right? So I just wa- watching him operate and watching some of the things they're going to do with him is going to be something that's fun during this OTA or this mini camp that we haven't really had in the past. We haven't really had because the offense was the same every year. We knew what to expect for Alvin. We knew what his action in the offense was going to look like. We really don't know that this time around. 
So that's going to be something that's just one of those elements that we didn't get during OTA. So that's going to be a focus during minicamp. When I take highlight videos, it's going to be primarily Alvin Kamara, Marshawn Lattimore, right? Like that's why I say highlights. So there's just B-roll at camp. That's really all they are. That's all they allow us to record is B-roll. That's why the cameras are out there. So they can get B-roll for TV. Um, and then, so that's really what, what I get, but people seem to like it. So I continue to record it and uh, I'll do that again as much as possible with Alvin and some of these guys that we haven't gotten a chance to see yet. Now that's kind of it in terms of stuff that's going to be new. You know, we're going to see a couple other players. I imagine we'll see a Nathan Shepard, right? Well, you know, all the players that maybe missed a session or two um, should be back. So it'll just be a good chance to get into it. One note on a position battle that doesn't exist right now for me before we go on, because it doesn't really qualify in either the offense or defense. So I'd rather handle it here. I don't see a, a position battle developing at either punter or kicker. I think that last year there was an inherent position battle because, because it feels like in hindsight that this team was ready to move on from Will Lutz, Blake Gillikin. It was just a question of whether the players you brought in, two rookies, were going to instill a level of confidence in you that they could do that last year, and they did. Now, we can we can debate whether the product that they put out was on that line of, hey, we weren't better off keeping Will Lutz or, or Gillikin around. Um, but... I do think that like the idea that you're going to come into this camp and you're going to do the same thing again, I don't think that's the case. I think the inverse of that is true. In last year, it was an inherent competition and the competition was really, okay, are Blake and Lou good enough to unseat those guys, right? And the answer was yes, they were good enough, at least in the eyes of the coaches. This year, it's not that. You're not looking for players to replace the guys you have. You are looking for, you know, potential diamonds in the rough who, if they show up and they ball out, which it can be tough to do as a punter or a kicker. There's only so many opportunities you have to really make a name for yourself. In this case, you have guys in the building that you like, and it's on the, the new kicker, the new punter, to be that good. And from what we've seen thus far, I don't anticipate that being the case. Not to say either of these guys can't kick. I just don't think you're going to go into another season with a rookie specialist if you don't have to. And the only way you have to is if that guy is just so head and shoulders above the guy you have. Now, you know, we haven't really seen kickoffs yet. And I think that's where if there is a punter or if there is a kicker competition, it will come at place kicker. I don't think Lou Headley's going to get challenged. I really don't. Um, and it's going to be a lot of it involved with, okay, directional kicking on kickoffs, stuff like that. And Charlie Smith ends up being good enough, consistent enough in the place kicking part of it that you're willing to bypass. Hey, he's going to struggle as a rookie. It's inevitable and, and, and roll with it. It's just a matter of how much you value that directional kicking. Now, kick return. That's going to be a bigger question. Right now, I just don't I, I can't sit here and say, hey, it's going to be this person versus this person for that secondary kick return spot. And that's kind of the thing. It's like Rashid Shahid is your returner. He's the guy. You know, it's kind of funny. I, w- I ended up stumbling across a Madden simulation, like a full 15-minute quarter Madden simulation of the Saints versus the Falcons in, in week four. And one of the, and the Saints ended up winning 49 to 35. And I was like, hey, the, the offense must have balled out. So I decided to watch it to see kind of how Madden simulated this happening, right? And it really was. I mean, the offense was fine, uh, but it wasn't anything spectacular. What what won the Saints the game there was a return touchdown, a kick return touchdown from Rashid Shahid, and a interception return touchdown on back to back passes by Kirk Cousins from Marshawn Lattimore, Kool Aid McKinstry. That's how you get to forty nine. Then the offense was fine. Alvin Kamara had a big day, but like that kick return element is a big part of that, right? Like, and Rashid Shahid's going to be a big part of that. But who is the second guy? And you have two back there in the new system. So you do want to identify, hey, who is that guy? Is it going to be one of your position players? Or are you going to keep an extra guy on the roster with the idea of doing that? Right now, I think you would much rather have it be someone who you have on the roster for something else. Because that's a, 
you already have a returner in Shahid. If you're keeping three quarterbacks, which that's kind of where I'm at right now, is you do keep three quarterbacks. Uh, the roster spots, you know, that 53 gets here fast. So just for context, and and this isn't really a roster battle, but these are the players that we saw returning kicks during the final OTA session when we saw a, a lot of work on the new kickoff drill. So obviously, Rashid Shahid. Then other guys, Mason Tipton, wide receiver out of Yale. Alante Taylor, obviously, uh, you know who he is. I don't need to tell you. He's out of Tennessee. Kendra Miller, running back. James Robinson, another running back. Jermaine Jackson, who is the obvious kind of choice if you were trying to keep an extra return specialist. Then Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams, which that kind of feels like this is to give Jamal something to do. I don't think he's in contention to be a return specialist. No offense to Jamal. It's just not – I don't look at Jamal and say, oh, he's he's a – <laughs> he's going to make a guy miss in the open field. No, he's a, he's a bull. That's where you have him here. So I, I don't know about that, but the, the, um, but the other guy to keep in mind, Kool-Aid McKinstry, number 34 hasn't been out there. And I think that at the end of the day, it's going to be really tough for anyone to move Kool-Aid off that spot, just because you're going to keep Kool-Aid on the roster. There's no question, but I don't know if you necessarily have a role for him in your regular defense right off the jump. So where is he going to contribute? I feel like it has to be special teams and it would have to be as that second return guy. And that happens to be a skill set that we know he has. So I really don't think there's a kicker, a kick return competition. I think it's just a matter of Kool-Aid showing you that he can do it next to Shahid, who we already know can do it. And then the question becomes punt return. And is it Shahid or McKinstry going back there to return punts? I imagine it'll be Shahid, but at the end of the day, it'd be nice to have more than one guy on the regular defense. So on the regular roster, so that, Hey, Rashid gets hurt in a game and you know who that is. And you're not concerned like, Oh my gosh, what's going to happen when we put it back there. So that's really what I'm looking at on special teams. Again, I don't really anticipate a punter or kicker competition, at least not a serious one. Like, well, you'll keep those guys all the way through camp because you can now, and that makes it a little easier to have those kicker competitions because you don't have to worry about that initial cut down. You keep 90 until the final cut down day, and then you cut, what, 37 players in one day, um, which is it's a lot. It's a lot of players to cut in one day, but you're able to keep those kickers around. So if a, if a competition does develop, you're not having to make that decision early. Because that's what usually that's what used to happen is you would have that extra punter, that extra kicker, you'd call it a camp leg, and then they were in the first ten cuts because you were just like, yeah, whatever, move on. That doesn't happen anymore. So if there there's still a chance that something develops there, but I'm not projecting one right now. But all right, let's wrap up that segment. We are going to come back. We're going to talk more position battles. It's going to be a position battles episode. I am keeping it simple for you because I spent all weekend laying on my couch wondering why my head hurt so much. And this is what I came up with. So keep it locked on Inside Black and Gold. We will be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. My voice has held up thus far. We will see how that goes. Got a little more bass than usual. Um, Probably better for you. Probably better for the listener that I don't have this kind of nasally Ray Romano voice for once. Uh, but hey, I'll uh, I'll take being healthy over sounding uh, more traditional on the radio. Anyway, we are continuing on this podcast episode, breaking down the position battles, or at least projecting what we anticipate to be something of a position battle. Now on defense, it's tough because I'm not just going to say, though, the position battle on the defensive line is is this and kind of just keep it vague. You have to kind of look at more granular spots on the defense right now i look at linebacker as one of the real position battles for starting jobs and there's not that many every year there's only a handful of positions that you say okay i don't know who the starter is right now and we're going to determine that in camp right now sometimes there's an entrenched guy and you'll see a player really kind of make a name for himself and push him and that's always kind of the inherent competition that exists. But like, I'm not going to tell you that, oh, Cam Jordan's fighting for his job, right? Uh, Carl Grandison's fighting for his job. Marshawn Lattimore's fighting for his job. Their jobs are theirs. It's just a matter of, okay, where do you kind of place everything? Where do you kind of put the pecking order of, of 
you know, how if they struggle, where what, where do we go from there? Um, and so you're going to see that. But at linebacker, I genuinely think Pete Werner is getting pushed for his job by Willie Gay. Now, you're, you're keeping both. Like, Willie Gay's on this roster. It's just a question of how you choose to use him. I think you're going to have a lot more base personnel than maybe you saw in the past because y- you have better athletes and you can really roll out that three linebacker look where you feel like Willie can cover. Um, you feel like Demario can cover. You feel like Pete can cover. So if you're going against a heavier look, you know, like some of these looks the 49ers give you, right, where where you have a fullback and you have two tight ends, right? Like you're not forced to match up with a defensive back on a tight end because you don't feel like you can cover with the linebackers in the game. And that's kind of where the game has shifted. That said, I do think that Pete and Willie are going to be competing for that Will linebacker spot. And it's not outside the realm of possibility that that Willie takes that. You know, he's a veteran player. He's won back-to-back Super Bowls. Like, he understands how to play in those big moments. And I feel like Pete has uh, fell off last year. I don't think he had a great year. And, you know, I think the talent is there. We saw how effective he can be early in that 2022 season before he dealt with some injuries. Just don't think he ever got back to that last year. And so, you know, I, I hope that that Willie being around at all can kind of light that fire under him and we'll see that. That said, it's one of my top position battles to watch. It's going to be Willie Gay versus Pete Werner in that those Will linebacker reps. Like not the not the not the base reps, although I think the alignment in those base reps will be telling. It's just mainly going to be okay, when you have a nickel corner on the field, who's standing next to DeMario? Right? And, and how are you utilizing that? And so that's my first one. The next, you know, it's not really a competition, but it is a big question to me because we've had to answer it each of the last two years and figure it out. Who is the CB3 and or the slot corner, right? Because I think between Alante Taylor and Kool-Aid McKinstry, you're going to have one be that backup outside corner and one be the starting slot corner. I don't anticipate that Kool-Aid's going to walk in year one and be head and shoulders the better slot corner so that if you do have both Marshawn and Paulson, that you would put him in there instead of Alante Taylor. But I do think he's going to push Alante in that role. I think you're going to see what you have there. And it's most likely going to be that the outside backup corner, the Ike Adam of last year, is going to be Kool-Aid McKinstry. But I do think that's, again, it's not really a competition per se, but that's going to be something that you have to establish during during training camp. Now, we're not going to see Kool-Aid during team drills in mandatory mini camp. That's what Dennis Allen told me last week. So that's really something we're going to have to push to training camp to get a good idea. And it's really more of a question of how do you deploy Kool-Aid? Like, what are his reps? Where are you putting him for his reps? How much is he getting on the outside? How much is he getting on the inside? What team is he lining up with? Is he behind Ugo Wamadi and Will Harris on the inside? Or does he get the second team reps to start? Or heck, maybe even the first team reps at some point as you go. That's just going to be something to watch. Moving on, another position battle per se. And it's, again, you know, the defense is tough because you really kind of got to see it's a rotation a lot of the time. It's not just one player. And my question is, where do you put Isaiah Foskey and Chase Young on the on the kind of pass rush pecking order you know are they both kind of your pass rush guys do you have a pass rush package with both of them in it um or is it kind of a de3 situation where cam comes off the field on obvious passing downs and you replace him with this guy and which guy is that is it chase young is it isaiah foskey now again this is a situation that we're not going to get a good answer in minicamp because chase young is dealing with an injury ideally he will be back for the beginning of training camp, but I don't think that's a guarantee. So it's something that we're going to want to see Isaiah Foskey really put his foot down and and own that DE3 spot, own that spot behind Cam Jordan, who I don't know if he will do team drills this week either. So it should be a good opportunity for Isaiah to really kind of make his case that in year two, the expectations for him can and should be a lot higher and as Dennis Allen has asked him to do repeatedly, cut it loose. So we'll see. Again, it's not really a competition this week, but it's going to be something to watch down the road and how that kind of shapes out because you do feel like, hey, between Peyton Turner, Isaiah Foskey, Chase Young, if you can get two of those players to contribute for a majority of the season, 
that's a huge win. Because you do feel confident, at least in the consistency of a Cam Jordan and a Carl Granderson, from like what you know they can do. Um, but you do need a piece or two, particularly from a pass rush player, to get out there. And you don't have Tano anymore, who can be that inside-outside guy. And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. Okay, so next up, the three technique. Now, this is the guy who kind of up, uh, lines up in that the three gap, you know, inside or outside the guard. And I think Colin Saunders, in, he's more of a nose, and I think he's safe in that role. Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa. I don't know why I pointed behind me. But Christian Boyd from Northern Iowa is, is another guy who's more of a nose. So I think that's kind of what you're looking at. And I don't think that Colin is going to get pushed in that role per se. Now, you don't always have that guy on the field. But again, you're just talking about that role. And I just kind of see him being that guy. Um, but the three techniques. So who is that? Is it Nathan Shepard? Is it Brian Brzee? Now, in the past, you've seen Brian Brzee be more of a pass downs player and Nathan Shepard be more of a rundowns player. So to me, the competition is not necessarily Brzee in that role that he already had. We know he's going to have that role. He's going to be a uh, pass downs defensive tackle who you can really kind of look at and say, hey, get some pressure on that guy. Make his life miserable from the interior. And particularly in matchups with slower-footed quarterbacks, that type of pressure, even a guy like Baker Mayfield, that pressure just ate him up in that Week 17 matchup last year. And you you anticipate that that will continue. Now, what about rundowns? Can Brian Brzee develop? He's a first-round pick. You did not pick him in the first round unless you thought he could be a three-down defensive tackle. So can he develop and become more of a rundowns player? Can he push Nathan Shepard off that spot and make Nathan Shepard the depth? And, and you keep Brzee on the field as much as possible. That's the question. And that's what I'm going to want to see from both of those guys. And we haven't seen Nathan Shepard yet. Again, I expect him to be there for minicamp. Uh, there has been no indication of anything else. But that's going to be, in my opinion, uh, a real position battle for who is that kind of go-to three technique when you only have one on the field. Now, you you can have two and you can have both of those guys and maybe that becomes the platoon when you do take Colin Saunders off the field and it's Nathan Shepard and Brian Brzee. But again, when you only have one, who is it? And that's that's going to be a competition. Next one, okay, NASCAR package, right? Who's going to be the guy in the NASCAR package that shifts inside? Now, that's not necessarily winning a competition, but I, I am curious who it's going to be because you don't have Tano Passino anymore. He's, you know, they're not saying he's out for the season, but come on. He tore his Achilles. He's out for the season. Uh, so who is that guy that shifts inside? Is it Peyton Turner? Is it Cam Jordan? You know, is it is it Carl Granderson? Right. Who, who makes the most sense shifting inside the defensive tackle when you want to get three or four defensive ends on the field? Because that's what the NASCAR package is. Just getting all the pass rushes out there and saying, good luck. Last year, you would have Tano in there with Brian Brzee, and it worked really well so who becomes that platoon guy with brian brzee because you're going to want one um i wouldn't mind seeing cam slide inside and take advantage of that bigger frame that he has and get a couple of the more athletic guys on the outside because i mean on the interior cam's cam is as athletic as they come right the the issue becomes on the outside when he's trying to chase guys down can he do that so that's just going to be something that we see again a lot of these aren't necessarily position battles they're just they're just positional questions and who kind of steps into those roles and owns them. And that's going to be one for me. Now there's one more legit position battle for this list on the defense, at least as far as I see it. And again, like people are going to say, well, aren't you competing every year? Shouldn't there be competition at every position? Sure. But you should also be realistic about who's competing for what. And like, I'm not going to tell you, like, oh, Marshawn, again, like, Marshawn should be looking over his shoulder. No, I mean, if he's here, he's the starter, right? Adebo, same thing. I mean, he already won that job. He was one of the big position battles last year. He won it. I'm not going to tell you that he's have to going to have to go through that again because he's not, right? Like, he won that position battle. Um, and and you're going to and you're gonna go from there. But one more position, and this one, I feel like I'm one of the few people who sees it going this way, is – you know, strong safety, for, call it what you want, strong safety. The Saints kind of interchange at the safety. You don't really have a traditional free safety, strong safety. But for the purposes here, I'm going to give you Tyron Matthew as your starting free safety so that you can say whoever the other, whatever you want to call the other position is the position battle, right? Who You're battling for the guy starting next to Tyron Matthew 
and playing the, the majority of those downs. Now, if it's a single safety, it's going to be probably be Tyron, right? If you're looking for a heavier set, you might take Tyron off the field, but Tyron never comes off the field. It's one of his greatest traits, so I don't think you're going to see that. But who is it going to be? Jonathan Abram, Ugo Amadi, Jordan Howden? I think any of those guys you could legitimately put in and say, hey, this is our best option right now. Um, to me, and I've said this before, so I'm going to stick with it, I kind of see Jonathan Abram as the as the clubhouse leader, as as the first of that pack. And I think people kind of look over him because it's like, oh, Jonathan Abram, he's a journeyman. You know, he he kind of got sent off the Raiders unceremoniously, ended up in Green Bay, ended up with the Saints. They cut him, put him on the practice squad last year. But he earned that spot late in the year. And he was one of the better defensive players late in the year for the Saints. He's also a leader in that room, right? Like people respect him. And I don't know. I I, th- I kind of think you're going to start this season with Howden in that back in that dime role and kind of contributing where you where you need him to and still learning and Jonathan Abram becomes that guy, but that's going to be something we see during camp. And that's going to be a an easier-ish one to track because okay, who gets first team, who gets second team? Right? What where do they line up? When do they line up? What are their roles? And we'll be able to determine kind of where everyone sits independent of how they actually play. Um, and that's one of the nice things about these early practices. So we can just kind of get, we can project whatever we want, but from a tracking perspective, like we just get a good idea of, okay, these are the people who line up with the ones, people who line up with the twos, so on and so forth. And that way, when camp gets here, if it changed and it's not because of injury, it's not because of whatever, then you get an idea. And that's what you see throughout camp. Now, sometimes you have to be careful about that because if so-and-so lines up with the ones on Tuesday, and then doesn't line up with the ones on Wednesday, it's not necessarily a sign that he got passed over in that role. It could just be they're alternating because it is a true position battle. That's what we saw with Alante Taylor and Paul Sanadibo. One day you had one with the ones, the next day you had the other one with the ones, and you kind of graded based off that. So you do need kind of a range, and that's part of the reason that one practice a week isn't really uh, – it, it can be can be difficult to make determinations of them. But that's the last one I have. If you have other ones on defense, make sure to throw them in the comments. I was, I, I, I was on the fence about a few positions, but it's just, it's just tough because we don't have a lot of the answers we need right now. And I'm going to do a more, a more established position battle episode as we get closer to training camp because a lot of the answers we get coming out of this week of practice will inform those position battle conversations but for now that's what i'm looking at and you're talking about willie gay versus pete warner who's the cb3 and who's in the slot between alante taylor kool-aid mckinstry we won't really get that answer because kool-aid won't be out there this week but he should be out there for camp and we should see him working in individual drills um who's kind of the third uh rung on the ladder in terms of defensive end snaps is it going to be isaiah foskey is it going to be chase young heck is it going to be uh peyton turner who is healthy right now and and we'll have to see Three technique, Shepard, Nathan Shepard, Brian Brzee. We'll find out who's the NASCAR package, like who is in that package, who shifts inside, who becomes that kind of speed rush on the outside. And then strong safety, whatever you want to call it, Jonathan Abram, Jordan Howden, Ugo Amadi, you know, option X that we don't really see right now, a UDFA. Does any, or, or, or do any UDFAs kind of insert themselves in the conversation? We'll find out. But all right, that's going to wrap up. That segment, we went through the defense. We've already talked about special teams. So what is left? Offensive position battles. Yeah, the ones that really make the money, the the positions that everyone's here to talk about. Because when we talk about OTAs, for whatever reason, a lot of the time, it feels like we are talking about the offense going against the defense on another team. And yeah, it's just because it's fun. You know, the offense is fun to watch, but it, it can be tough at times because, you know, you it's like, oh, what a great play by the offense. But then it's like, oh, wait, or was it a bad play by the defense? Because because both of them are the Saints. <laughs> oh, what a great play by the defense. Or was it just a terrible throw by the quarterback? Because both of them are the Saints. <laughs> that that becomes, becomes tough, but we'll figure it out. Either way, yes, we are going to talk about quarterbacks in the next segment. Stick around. I'm Jeff Nowak. This is Inside Black and Gold. We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I am Jeff Noah coming at you solo. One more segment previewing position battles for this week's mandatory minicamp and 
going forward and the rest of the offseason, uh, which we will get a pretty long break from any real Saints content after this week. So enjoy it while it's here. Uh, I know I will. It's going to be hot. I'm going to be sweating a lot, and uh, we're going to talk about it. But let's first go through, let's project some of the position battles on offense. And first things first, yes, we're going to talk about the backup quarterback competition. Now, I feel like we've talked extensively about Jake Hayner, about Spencer Rattler, about that whole situation. So I don't feel like I need to go into it too much, right? Like, I feel like we all kind of know the score at this point. And in my opinion, right now, if you had to pick one right now, Jake Hayner is the 10 out of 10 pick to be the backup quarterback for the Saints this year. I don't think either is really in contention to even consider starting like that's I know we're going to hear from people like wow why why do we talk about these two exclusively in the backup conversation so there's a fly <laughs> and it's because they are that's just where we are right like we just be realistic about what we're talking about and that's the backup conversation that said I don't really look at this week as a competition between those two guys I look at this week as a competition between those two guys and themselves. Jake Hayner is going out there looking to prove and 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 solidify his own standing as this guy can be our backup quarterback, right? Like that's what he's doing. He's not going out there and going shot for shot with Spencer Rattler. That's not what he's what he's out there to do. He is competing against himself because the in my opinion right now the only way he loses that backup job at this point is by looking like a guy who can't be a backup at the NFL level. So uh, it's on him to just kind of maintain. Spencer, his his competition is to prove that he's a guy you need to keep on the roster, right? To, to, to not look like a guy who has no business being at the NFL level. And once you can do that, then we can talk about a competition. There's a chance we get to that point in training camp. Right now, this is not a competition between those two guys. That said, like these guys are going to be talked about in a competition all offseason. So for those purposes, I will have them here. Right now, I don't think it's that close. Right now, I, again, I don't think it's like, hey, one of these guys is going to win that job. Right now, the backup to me is Jake Hayner. And Spencer, again, is, is fighting to prove that you should use that extra roster spot on a quarterback because I can develop over time. <laughs> <laughs> that's the conversation with Spencer. And that's all I'm really going to say about it. Cause we're going to, I think we're going to get a much better picture at the end of this week as to how he has progressed from rookie minicamp, first day of OTAs, second day of OTAs, third day of OTAs, which was admittedly his best day. And that's a good sign for him. So we'll get, we're going to get three days here and we'll, and we'll find out. Um, but you know, if he, if he comes out and balls out, then Hey, maybe when we talk about the position battles, Going into training camp, this will have a different tone to it. Right now, it's, it is, Spencer does not need to be worried about winning a backup job. Spencer needs to be worried about winning an NFL roster spot. And we'll go from there. All right, moving, moving down the line. You're talking about the running back two slash three, right? And there's two separate running back competitions going on here, in my opinion. Because I think right now, Jamal Williams is still that RB2. I think his, his kind of status in that room is still as the RB2. I don't think that that's concrete. I think that he's going to have to solidify that. He's going to have to earn that, and we'll see. He has looked solid through OTAs. Like there's, There haven't been any red flags, as far as I can tell. You know, He's still nerding out to Pokemon and doing all his thing. He's still that guy. Um, and and he's, a fa- he's a favorite in the locker room. People like him, and that's, a good, that, that's helpful. Like, whether you believe that to be true or not, when people like you, you have a better chance at sticking with a roster. And we'll, we'll, we'll continue that. But I think the RB2 question is between Kendra and Jamal. If, if Kendra comes out, Kendra Miller comes out and shows like, hey, I'm, the, I'm the, the second rung on this ladder. I'm the guy that you should be giving those second team reps to. I'm the guy who should be in there when Alvin's got to come out because I can make big plays and I can be trusted in short yardage scenarios. Then I think you be, you get into a different conversation with Jamal because I don't think you keep Jamal as your RB three. I think you're paying him too much 
to be your RB3. So that's kind of a question there for me. Right now, I give the edge to Jamal just because we haven't really seen much out of Kendra. And I just think that there's consistency issues there that the coaching staff is not thrilled with. And he's going to have to do a lot to earn that spot. Either way, that's going to be a competition to me. Like that's a legitimate competition in the sense that, hey, if Kendra comes in and balls out, particularly in the preseason games, who knows? Like it can be tough to, to gauge a running back based on practices without pads. And that's what we've had this far as we're going to have this week. So I don't know if we're going to see anything that's going to tell you pot, like, like concrete one way or the other. It's like, oh, this guy, this is the guy. But it's going to be a competition we watch. Next, RB3 slash four. The questions are twofold. How many running backs do you keep? And based on the answer to that question, who are they? Now, I would be surprised if you keep more than three just because Taysom is kind of operating as a fullback anyway. So it kind of ends up in that room, and we're going to have to talk about this um, during the next roster projection, which I'm going to do after this week. Um, So right now, I'm going to say three. I'm going to say you keep three running backs. um, And right now, if that's the case, the competition becomes, hey, who is that third running back? So you're looking at some type of competition between Jamal or Kendra, like whoever doesn't establish themselves as that RB2, then Jordan Mims. James Robinson, Jacob Cabote, you know, somebody, I don't know. At the end of the day, that RB3 is going to have to play special teams. So it's a tougher competition to gauge. It's a tougher, it's a tougher competition to look at and say, well, that's the third best running back because he's not going to get on the field, at least not for regular offensive snaps with everybody healthy. So it's going to be like, can you go make a tackle on kickoffs and pump returns? Cause that's why Dwayne Washington was here all those years. It wasn't because they really felt like he could run a screen. You know, it wasn't because they felt like, oh, these backside zone cutbacks, he's got it. No, it was because he was a special teams ace. So when you're talking about RB3-4, and that's why when I say if Jamal's not your RB2, I don't think he's on the roster. Because if you're trying to find someone who can contribute on special teams, it's not going to be him. No offense to Jamal, it's just not what he's done. Um, so a guy like Jordan Mims, probably becomes that option. Now, if Jamal is your RB2, Kendra ends up your RB3 because you spend a third round pick on him. You can't really move on from him. But either way, that's going to be that's going to be something to watch. That's the next battle. And, and it's kind of hard to talk about the second one without talking about the first one. But either way, understand that there's two positions there and I don't think either of them are concrete. Next up, and this is the last one that we talk about before, three true starting position battles. Um, now, and it's going to be wide receiver three and four, right? And and three is really the bigger question here because I do think you have to kind of decide on the wide receiver four. But again, just like running back three, that's going to be a special teams conversation, probably more so than just talent conversation. So wide receiver three, who is it going to be, right? Is it A.T. Perry? Is it Cedric Wilson? Is it UDFA X or Y? Right. That's going to be a question. I don't think anyone has really pushed themselves into the front of that conversation quite yet. A.T. Perry is the obvious pick. I think he's on the roster either way, because I think that he, as a big, tall wide receiver, does things that can't be replicated by some other guys. So you're going to keep him in that, whether he's the wide receiver three, whether he is a guy that gets on the field a lot, or if he's a guy that gets used in specialty situations, red zone, et cetera. That's another question. But right now, I I kind of look at A.T. Perry, Cedric Wilson as the most obvious choices. You know, I talked about the uh, the Madden simulation for Saints Falcons. And (laughs) for whatever reason, Madden, I mean, the Madden version of Derek Carr was peppering Cedric Wilson with targets. I mean, every time I looked up, I was like, 11. Why is 11 keep catching the ball? I don't know. He was open. So Madden likes Cedric Wilson. That said, I haven't been a huge fan of Cedric Wilson's hands. I think he's dropped a couple passes that were catchable and as a veteran like that's kind of you just need to make the catches like you're not going to get a ton of targets you got to make the receptions that are makeable and i don't know if he's done enough of that but that said his understanding of the offense he comes from miami a scheme that it's going to be similar to this you know miami does this thing where they motion on every single snap and i think the saints are going to get pretty close to that i don't know if they'll motion on every snap but i think you're going to motion a lot And there's going to be a lot of things that he just kind of understands that other guys are going to have to learn. And so that's going to give him an advantage. Um, Either way, right now, 
it, it's tough. And so that's going to be one to watch is Cedric Wilson, A.T. Perry, or does someone else emerge? Right now, I don't think there's a ton of depth there. I think you're you're going to kind of look and see, hey, who can get the job done and and go from there behind Alave and Shahid. Um, I don't think there's a lot of love for this wide receiver room outside of New Orleans. I think locally people have a really strong appreciation for the kind of elevated expectations for Chris Olave this year, what Shahid can do in terms of stretching a defense. But I think outside of New Orleans, everyone's like, really, that's your wide receiver room. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, I do think if, if A.T. Perry can kind of step into that role and you have that really, really strong young core of receivers, you know, uh, I feel good about it. Two third-year players and a second-year player kind of coming into their own. We'll see. But for now, let's move on. Now, the, the next three positions are starting positions. Not particularly exciting ones, but important ones nonetheless. And they all land on the offensive line. Now, one of them is a split offensive lineman, and it's, it's the tight end position. Because right now, I just don't I don't know. Like, Jawan's situation is weird. I think Jawan is the answer um, in terms of he's your starter, he's your move tight end. But I do kind of feel like it's a it's another situation where Jawan is going against himself. Like Jawan needs to show that in this offense he can be a threat. He needs to show that he has that kind of chemistry with Derek Carr um, that we saw at the end of last season. But we need to see that more this year than we did last year. And so it's not really a, a battle, but you know. We we saw Dallin Holker getting first team reps at points. We've seen Michael Jacobson catch a ton of passes. Like Foster Moreau is still there. He's going to have a role. So what do you do with Jawan Johnson? Is he that kind of volume move tight end, or do you kind of start looking in other directions? And I think that's going to be something that he has to show during camp, the way he did last year. But you know, hopefully, it's not as much of a mirage as it as it was at the beginning of last year. The next two positions are on the offensive line. And that's left guard, Nick Saldaveri versus, I guess right now it's Shane Lemieux. The other guy to watch is Lucas Patrick, but he's been working more as a center. So I think that that's kind of where he is uh, profiling right now is to be kind of your backup center, or probably a guy that ends up on the practice squad. But you have him if you need him, because I do think you want a dedicated backup center somewhere. <laughs> and you can elevate a guy off the practice squad. So it's not the end of the world for that guy. Um, so I think right now it's Nick Saldaveri versus Shane Lemieux. My gut instinct tells me that that Shane Lemieux would take the job over time. Like my gut instinct tells me you're going to get closer to the regular season and you're going to be like, man, we have a rookie left tackle. Do we really want to have a, a, a guy making his NFL debut at left guard and just have our entire left side of the line be a gigantic question mark as to how they're going to operate in their first NFL game? Uh <laughs> that's that's a scary idea to me. And I have to I just imagine that it, it, Nick would have to play so well to to take away that fear. Um, and I just don't see it happening. Like, I think he, he ends up going in as kind of your game day backup. And then maybe during the season, you make that switch. Either way, it's going to be a competition. And Nick has a chance there. They're going to give him an opportunity to go win that job. And we'll see how that goes. But that is very much a position battle. There's a couple of guys that we haven't really seen work yet. And and that's going to come into the equation at the the next spot, which is right tackle. And I kind of think it's it's Trevor Penning versus himself because they're going to give him every opportunity to win that job. You know, and, and I've said this a few times, it's kind of a cop out, but I don't know who your backup right tackle is. It's probably Landon Young. Um, is your backup starting right tackle? Oli Udo is a guy that we really haven't seen work yet. I think. Uh, you know, he's a guy that was signed from the Vikings, right? He He's the guy that Clint Kubiak knows. Um, so there should be some confidence there in terms of what he's going to be able to do. And we asked Dennis Allen if he's a guard or a tackle. He kind of talked about how they feel like he can play both positions. So we don't really know. Maybe he factors in to the left guard conversation. Maybe he factors in to the right tackle conversation. Maybe he factors in to the left tackle conversation as a backup or even a swing tackle who can play both sides. We don't know, but that's going to be something we watch. Um, he's clearly coming back from some kind of injury. But this team wants Trevor Penning to be their starting right tackle, as they should. Like They, they need to get value out of that pick if they can. And so... That's going to be the that's going to be the question is can you trust Trevor Penning at right tackle? Can you? Cuz if you can, he's going to have that job. If you can't, you have to be able to pivot. And so 
you know, it's less a competition between Trevor Penning and and another person, and it's more a competition between Trevor Penning and himself, and then everyone else who wants to establish themselves as that starter if they have to pivot out of the Trevor Penning conversation. So that's it. And to me, that's the last true position battle, right? Like I'm we're not talking about Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz. You're not talking about Alvin Kamara at RB1. You're not really talking about Derek Carr at quarterback. You're not really talking about Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid. I think their roles are very entrenched. Um, so that's what you have. And so, again, you're talking about the backup QB competition. Again, like I said, right now, I think it's more – both guys are competing against themselves. The running back two spot with Jamal and Kendra. The running back three spot with with whoever doesn't win that job. And then guys like Jordan Mims, James Robinson, maybe Jacob Cabote. Wide receiver three. Are you talking about A.T. Perry, Cedric Wilson, or player to be named later? Left guard, Sal DeVere versus Shane Lemieux or Lucas Patrick. Right tackle, Trevor Penning. Can he be that guy? Um, or do you have to go with an Ole Udo, a Landon Young, something like that? Or tight end, again, Jawan, prove that you are that guy. That's the competition that you have. But all right, that's it. Those are the position battles we are previewing heading into minicamp. Starts on Tuesday, ends on Thursday, three straight days of practices. We will be out there for all three of them. And so it's tough to say right now when we'll be recording. I would prefer to record a podcast after all three days. Because if not, then we would end up recording on Wednesday and then Thursday we wouldn't get to until Monday. It's really a question of, okay, what happens Tuesday and Wednesday? And is there stuff that we'd need to talk about Friday or Thursday? So I'm just saying this to kind of uh, set the expectations that we may have an episode on Thursday. There's big news coming out Tuesday or Wednesday. We will have a podcast and talk about it. And then we'll just have to push Thursday to the next episode. Either way, stay tuned. We will have a second episode this week reacting to either two or three days of minicamp. We will not have an episode tomorrow. <laughs> but all right. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I'm Jeff Nowak. This is Inside Black and Gold. Hopefully, my voice recovers by the next time we record. But if not, who that? Go Saints. Be easy, y'all. Peace.